All right, everybody, welcome to Today in Space. I am, as always, your space science podcast host from the East Coast, Alex Giorfanos, and we're sitting here. The Starship IFT-6 test flight took off exactly on time at 5 p.m. Central Time, and we now have the stream open for the Starship. Starship's in orbit, uh, the engines are shut off, and they're going to aggressively try and land the Starship booster here through the atmosphere to kind of test the, and I, this is why I love the rapid iteration that SpaceX does. You know, we apply that to our 3D printing that we do here. You know, getting as much data as fast as possible going into space is a very, very powerful tool. And SpaceX is the master of that. And so <laughs> now we're looking here at uh, a zero G banana uh, that they have in the payload because man, they have the best test payloads of anybody <laughs> in the space industry. Uh, but they're rapidly testing to get data, right? So every time they do these test flights, they get more data to see how close uh, uh, to the reality of physics do they have this understanding because Starship is going to be taking humans to space. That's that's the purpose, going to places like the moon. It's going to be used in the Artemis three mission as the lander, for humans to touch foot on the surface of the moon again. And then it's going to be used to go to Mars very, very uh, soon, as soon as 2026. They're going to at least try to get Starship ready to try that landing. So Starship is in the the developmental stage. stage. This space development is happening before our eyes, and it's going to help enable a bunch of things to happen in space that we've only ever dreamed of happening. You know, if we talk about, you ever heard someone talk about the space economy, that doesn't really exist yet. (laughs) There's there, there's people paying to go to space, of course. But as far as an economy that has kind of established means and mechanisms and things that you can expect, the space industry is 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 not there but there we're very very close with systems like starship china has their uh starship uh knockoff that they've built as well and we've got plenty of other companies around the u.s never mind the world that are working on this now you know it's it reusability has been shown to be really really viable and if there's going to be something like a space economy reusability is the only way to control those costs for going to space. And that's what this whole game is, is the cost of going to space. So as we sit here and watch this banana suspended inside the payload for Starship, uh, which has the Pez Pez dispenser, which is a funny name for the deploying mechanism for all the Starlink satellites. You guys may know Starlink. It is the thing that's being deployed in all these natural disasters, any any of the hurricanes that happened recently, uh, obviously in Ukraine, like around the world, um, these Starlink satellites are being deployed to bring satellite internet to people around the world. SpaceX and T-Mobile just started uh, doing their first attempts during the hurricane relief to beam service directly to people's cell phones. So that, as far as the space economy is concerned, is going to be hugely valuable for SpaceX to continue getting money for Starship to keep developing it. Starlink is the big mechanism, and this Pez dispenser that's in the payload with the zero-G banana is going to be the thing that they need to test before sending the satellites up there so that that way, that way they know that it's going to deploy well before they start putting up the fleet. Really, this test is, is doing a lot for SpaceX. Uh, and so far, so breakdown of the test so far. So Liftoff went well. It went right on time, which means all their preparation leading up to it, as long as all things are go, they're able to light those 33 Raptor engines. This is the second time in a row for successful, uh, full, well, you know, booster recovery uh, missions where all the engines have lit and they've all also relit on reentry. So anyways, liftoff, great. Uh, Hot stage separation, great. Both the booster did the boost ba- boost back burn to get away from the starship and prepare to either land offshore or land uh, inside the chopsticks of the launch pad. We had the uh, starship light all six of its engines and get away. The booster dispensed of the 
a hot stage separation ring and made its way back to uh, shore. From what we know from the live broadcast, the tower was uh, all good. The, all the checks on the tower, the arms, make sure they could position, make sure it was ready for the booster and the people were ready for the booster. That was go, but something on the booster uh, wasn't good enough for them to try that. And so they did the landing, the soft landing on the ocean offshore so that they could still attempt get good data on the landing. And it was smooth. It was really nice. And they look like they have an understanding of this, what, 25, 26 story building that they're landing after it comes back from space. Uh, absolutely wild um, that they were able to do that successfully. And for anyone that's uh, upset that the the chopstick, you know, landing at the pad didn't happen, look, there's a lot of risk with going back to the pad. I mean, that goes without saying, but but literal examples and, and what it would cost them if they tried that, if they try and land that booster back at the pad and it doesn't work, now they have, they have basically an intercontinental ballistic missile uh, that is going to impact the pad, take out the pad, destroy the pad, which means they're going to have to build a new pad. They're also going to get hit with at least investigations from the FAA. I don't know all the intricacies of it, but the FAA will not be happy uh, with SpaceX if they did that. They would have hurdles to go through as well as financial problems. And, and those FAA hurdles may come with fines too. So if anyone's upset with that, look, it, it's only been a month since the last Starship attempt. So we're going to start getting these at a, at a rate that I don't think anyone is ready for, uh, even myself, uh, you know, trying to cover these. It's, it's crazy trying to schedule around making sure that we can do a reaction episode uh, because the schedule for Starship is very unknown until right about uh, a week you know, before, and even at up to the day, and during the day, things can change completely, so the SpaceX Starship team is doing amazing work, I'm sure it is intense long hours, and and they probably need more people to do what they're doing, but that crew is going above and beyond and showing us some truly remarkable feats of engineering. All right, folks, let's take a quick break from the Starship review. Let's talk about EG 3D printing. If you guys don't know, that's our 3D printing lab that we have in here. We specialize in rapid development of ideas, just like SpaceX. But we do that for 3D printing and specifically for parts. You know, for years we've been doing, we started in 2016, for years we've been offering a 3D print service so that you can send us your parts or your ideas and we can help make them for you. And now in 2024 and beyond, we're going the next step. We're now introducing the part detective. That is giving you access to the almost decade of experience that I have designing, troubleshooting, and working around the problems of 3D printing so that you can be successful. Now it's available to you. So if you go to ag3d-printing.com, you can check out. We have our schedule. It's available. You can book time with us today. You can also email us at ag3dpartdetective and just start the conversation. See what you're looking for. I can see if I can help, and then we can go from there. And one of the great examples that's perfect for right now is let's say you are looking to get someone you love a 3D printer for Christmas. It's a, it's a, a common scenario I've seen many, many times. Do you know what you're looking for? Do you know what printer you want? Do you have an idea of what your loved one wants, but you're just not sure what to get? There's a perfect reason to book the part detective. So you can book 30 minutes with us. We can go through all of that. I can ask you a bunch of questions and dial in the different printers based on your budget, based on your needs, and most importantly, so that way that printer doesn't end up on a shelf gathering dust. You know you've bought the right one, and then the person that gets it, depending on their skill, their age, their experience, they're going to be able to use it. So that's the part detective at ag3d-printing.com. Book 30 minutes with us today, and there's so many different ways you can use it. Go check out the last episode to learn more about that. That's ag3d-printing.com. Email us at ag3dpartdetective at gmail.com. And that's it, folks. Part Detective. Cool stuff. Leverage our experience today. Now let's get back to the show. We are re-entering here. Altitude's going down 122 kilometers. Still flying in at 26,700 kilometers per hour which is 
absolutely nuts. 40 minutes and 30 seconds into flight, and they have, so this is the thing they were talking about, the aggressive re-entry that they were trying to do. So um, they're trying to push Starship, the ship portion, to its absolute limits uh, as far as they understand it. So uh, as far as like how they position this test, which I love thinking about, I love prepping developmental tests. I've been a part of some for, for technology before, but like setting up a test that really gives you some the, the right information and maybe crack answers or, sol- or, or give you more data to tell you something about it that maybe you didn't even think about, right? Um, for this, for the re-entry, they've got the the angle of attack. So so the booster. Oh, let's let's do it on our on our starship pen. So instead of coming in the belly flop procedure, you know, with the belly down, shedding off uh, energy and speed as they hit the atmosphere, they're they're actually coming at it with a high angle of attack. So the nose is is very, very high uh, according to how it's coming in. So that's going to be aggressive for the flaps and for the heat distribution as it displaces all that heat with the heat tiles, right? So for this angle of attack, this is going to tell them how good is their system on board? How good is their thermodynamics? How good are their models? How good is their simulation, right? Because... And that's the the amazing thing about space that's different from a lot of different industries that have kind of been around for a long time. Space is space travel, space engineering is not that old uh, as far as a as a as a practical science, right? We don't know. We have a lot of simulation tools, right? Right? We got a lot of simulation tools out there. But the best and they get you 85% of the way there, right? If you have great basic understanding of stuff. And then you get the data of the real life thing, and then you you move on, right? You go, okay, we got this. We didn't understand this. Let's make that adjustment for the next flight. Or maybe, uh, which happens, <laughs> this happens, maybe that 85% that you could have potentially been at, you realize you missed something fundamental in that whole thing, and the, re- and the real test shows you that you've got to get back to your simulation and redo that. The amount of thermodynamics and uh, fluid dynamics that are happening here, uh, not to mention the limits of motors and and those flaps and, and material science, right? The stainless steel that they use. Um, there's there's so many different factors, and I mean we we learned so much even with the the Boeing uh, incident with Starliner, right? There was a lot of things that were in that initial understanding of it that when it was in space being used, there was a different thermal expansion of that poppet, right? That was, that was measuring the, the fuel. So they were, the, that, that thruster might not have worked, right? So they had to go back to the drawing board and, and everything ended up working up, working well, but it's about assessing risk at the end of the day. So anyways, we're going, we're going back to this. Uh, right out of kilometers, I absolutely love the, plasma buildup. I mean, as someone that went to school for aerospace engineering from 2008 to 2015, that's right, you can do your math. Uh, I would have loved to see a real life view of the thing that we were learning about, right? The thermodynamics, um, seeing it in action, you know, and 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 the idea of, of getting a, a simulation back then, the cost have come down a lot more companies are more apt to use it but you know getting that visual representation of the science that you were learning was so difficult and that's why I love what SpaceX does the amount of views that we have here uh, are, are truly truly remarkable and they honestly from a production perspective they they outdo NASA in a lot of in a lot of ways so another great thing that that SpaceX is doing to kind of push us forward into the future and blue origin is doing a good job of that too i do like their production um i just want to see more from them that's that's my big critique of blue origin is this kind of like cloak technique of of their development which is not anything new we it's very hard to see like space development in progress it's one of the beautiful things that spacex has shown us 
is all the the ugly moments and the tests before like the Apollo 11 launch, right? Or like before you actually send humans up there. How did you get there? I think people are way more interested in that nowadays uh, than, you know, and they, and they were back in the space days, right? Um, there, there, was, there was a moment where we almost didn't get a camera on some of the most culturally influential moments that space has brought the human uh, the humanity um like the voyager probes right i mean going back to like what what's necessary starship is going to have to be really robust i mean we're talking about i had this realization i think the first time they they launched starship and or they were about to right now there's no abort option for starship right you're going to be sending humans um but it's it's not like there's going to be like a crew escape capsule like there was on Saturn V or with the Crew Dragon, right? The Crew Dragon can commit uh, an abort and get away. Um, there's no like seat deployment to a parachute, right? Like a jet plane. Uh, you can't just blow the cockpit, uh, as far as I understand, uh, right now. So it means that they really need to understand uh, Starship at an incredible level to a point where it has the same kind of safety factor as a, as a commercial airplane. Um, so it, it's, it's really what they need to learn is the reason why they have so many of these tests planned and why they're going to start seeing them fly this more and more often. And with them taking more away from it, like from an engineer, from someone who's, who's worked in R and D, research and development and and had to create tests to make progress right to towards understanding what SpaceX is doing is and it's what anyone is doing with a good rapid iterating process your tests are built to push your limits and to have the possibility to break stuff and there's a lot of times where tests aren't aggressive enough and then things are found later as opposed to before so they could be fixed um and as we're looking at starship uh boil off i mean there's just a bunch of steam there i, I don't know it's probably the tiles cooking um as you know we saw with that test in the in the chamber you know these tiles are probably melting that's probably the way they dissipate heat right is that as soon as the surface uh, gets hot enough to come off. It's ablative, so the heat comes off, and it starts off with a cooler section again for that to build up, and then come off. So and that way, that heat doesn't transfer to the ship because again, there's going to be humans on board. You know, and going back to heat tiles, you know, the the last great era of space for America was the space shuttle, and we know that. On one of those cases, the the heat tile on board uh, was an issue, and that caused the loss of all those lives and the crew uh, because of that, uh, because of the situation that when NASA was put in then to make a decision, and that decision cost lives, and that that is space. That that is going to be what SpaceX will have to face. Right, they're the ones. Uh, that will be sending humans, their own humans, not to mention NASA astronauts and probably whoever else can pay for it. Um, so there's there's always a lot uh, at, at at risk. And so why are they doing these flight tests? Because we need to get more information because we've got to learn those mistakes now. You know, imagine if they had flown the space shuttle, you know, a thousand times before they put human beings on it to tune the heat shield technology right? Um, the space shuttle was too expensive to do that, but let's just say hypothetically they did. NASA would have had a tremendous simulation on heat distribution and ways to, you know, how does it react to coming back in? Um, so there's, there, there, there's no, if you can afford it, there's no reason uh, not to get as much data as possible before putting humans on board. And SpaceX is doing that. So Starship's been cooking as it's been coming in the tiles seem to be holding up the flaps seem to be holding up 
Okay, flaps are still good. Oop, we're starting to see some charring on, I think, the right flap, left flap. Looks like that heat concentration at the top of the the flap is starting to get too much. Or that metal has just been cooking. Those tiles have been cooking, and it's finally taken over. We saw a very beat up Finn do it last time, so uh, flap. So we'll see. Yeah, it's a beautiful ship. Where's the zero G banana? <laughs> Is the zero G banana still okay? Okay, so our plasma has pretty much gone away. The metal definitely has some discoloration, some heating, probably. That starship is cooking. Ooh, that is a molten flipper. We can see that we are beginning. Starship has passed maximum entry dynamic pressure. All right, great call out there. But we can see on this view here that we do have some heating there. On that looks like one of the forward flaps on Starship. This is. To be expected, we knew that the vehicle uh, would... Again, it was much worse on IFT4. Okay, 37 kilometers. 5,000 kilometers per hour. Whew. Almost under 1,000 kilometers per hour. Okay, we're starting to get some air here. Oh, this is so cool watching this thing fly. By the way, a friend of mine, uh, Eric, was mentioning, you know, these uh, Battlestar Galactica, something that, you know, I was aware of. I never watched fully, um, but he's a huge fan. And uh, the way that they shot it with the spacecraft, with the, the angle down the, the ship, I mean, SpaceX has done that. I'm sure that wasn't on uh, by accident. Um, but it's such a cool view. And seeing these flaps work be dynamic in this situation is is awesome. I love it. I mean, the, the, they're bringing the, the ship back. It's it's wild. They're flying this this giant squid back into a controlled manner to try and land. Crazy. Trying to land a tube. God, this is so cool. Yeah, it looks like everything's reacting. 6.8 million viewers. Holy crud. And all of this high quality foot footage is being beamed, and the connection because of Starlink. Like, wild. All right, we're going to pass through the clouds here in just a sec. It's like back to the future. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right, we, we passed through the clouds. That cloud layer. Definitely getting more aggressive here. Only one kilometer left. We're going to be landing here soon. All right, here we go. It looks like they have control. Now let's see if they can pull this re-entry burn off. Oh, there's the ocean. Here we go. Here we go. Oh. Oh. Overcorrecting. Overcorrecting. Yes. Oh, this view is amazing. Whoa. Yeah. Beautiful. Up. Oh. Are we going to see an explosion? Oh, we got we got the pylon. Buoy cam. All right, it's floating, but I don't know if it's going to survive. It's on fire. Tank probably burst. Oh, I think we're going to explode. Wow. Wow, that is, as they've been saying all day, bananas. So the the booster, soft touch landed, uh, didn't we didn't see it blow up. It might have, but it, we didn't see it blow up. It it got 
it did the physics right, right? It slowed itself down. It did the touchdown. If it was able to orient itself to the pad to get into those locking rings to be caught by the chopsticks, it would have been successful. The Starship first stage, the actual ship, did a great soft touch landing, did peak heating, the the flaps did what they were supposed to. One was charred up, but less charred than the, the last one we saw that still had a soft touchdown on the ocean. I mean, this is a, this is a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. SpaceX team, great, great job. And uh, man, the work that all these people are doing uh, and the work that they have to do now that they're successful uh, is truly, truly amazing. So great work, SpaceX. Huge day uh, in the space industry and uh, for the future of sending humans into space. So that's it, folks. Spread love, spread science, and we'll see you on the next episode of Today in Space.